All right, Grace Point family, we are back with you tonight for another uh, session, a portion of our midweek Bible study. We're in Romans uh, chapter 7, getting into Romans chapter 8 tonight a little bit, which is an exciting uh, book of the Bible. I've heard uh, many, many uh, preachers, commenters, uh, or commentators talk about Romans chapter 8 as like the Mount Everest of the Bible, like Romans chapter 8 is amazing. So we'll get into that a little bit tonight. We're excited to have you with us, and uh, we're just, we're excited that uh, it's springtime. Good weather out there. We hope you're enjoying your family time. I uh, hope you're uh, staying safe and healthy, uh, and we'll just, we'll just jump right in here tonight with, uh, with a word of prayer as we, uh, as we get going uh, over this stuff tonight. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And Father, as we, as we think about uh, all the different people that are involved in different uh, levels of this stuff, fighting, the, fighting this battle, uh, health care uh, individuals, those that are uh, doing essential jobs uh, for our country, for our infrastructure, for, um, just for our communities to continue to run. We pray for their safety and their health, Father God, and we just, we just continue to, to seek after you in what we need to do to help our communities in different ways. I thank you for those that have, that have gone above and beyond sacrificially to help their neighbors. Uh, I think of um, this coronavirus response team that we have in Bloomfield. Continue to work through that, Father God. Uh, God, we have, we have several people that, that have been affected with their jobs in this way, and I pray that you would be with them uh, during this time. We have uh, health concerns that have, that have happened, and Father, we pray that you would be with those as well. And, and you know every detail. Uh, you know everything that's going on, and so I just pray, Father, that you would, would touch our, our church family in Bloomfield and, and just let that be, um, uh, let, let, us, let us be able to really sense your movement where we can, where we can best be used uh, to show people your love, Father. We just, we just love you, and we, we pray for, for Bloomfield in that way, Father. Lord, we just um, continue to pray for both campuses, for Sheraton, for the situations that are happening here. Um, Lord, we pray for Bob and Connie through this time, and um, Lord, that you just continue to keep your hand on that situation, continue to show them that you are right there um, by them through this whole thing. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to be with the doctors as they help in this situation, continue to guide their hands, continue to guide their minds. And Lord, I just, I just um, pray for those who in, in our Sheraton campus that are still working, um, that you, you continue to keep them protected, Lord. And Lord, I pray for those that will soon be going back to work, that you'll just continue to keep a hedge of protection around them as well. And Lord, I, I just pray that you just continue to keep the, the protection around those in both of our campuses, Lord, our church family. And Lord, I just thank you for the protection you've already given us, and I just pray that you continue. Lord, we just thank you for this time we get together together and through our through the internet um, and come together for a Bible study. And Lord, I just pray that you open up our hearts and our minds to what it is that you want us to learn out of this lesson tonight. We just thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, what do you got for us tonight, Marcy? So um, last week we kind of went through um, Romans 7 through 1 through 13. So tonight we're going to kind of pick it up at 14 um, through 25. And like you said, kind of get into Romans chapter 8. I didn't want to leave us at kind of a, a I mean, the, the end of chapter 7 gets a little brighter, but I didn't want to quite leave us there. I wanted to kind of push us a little bit into Romans chapter 8. Good. So um, let's go ahead and read through Romans uh, chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. All right. uh, starts off, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, 
This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. So once again, we're still kind of on these I statements that Paul's giving us. Um, to be an understanding of Paul's story, like prior to you know prior to coming to his Damascus Road, you know, in, uh, time. I sorry, I'm kind of at a loss for words tonight. But <laughs> anyway, um, so before he comes to to that meeting. Um, but it's also kind of our story. Um, and then I wanted to kind of bring out this quote real quick as we've kind of gone through Romans 7 now, read through the entire entirety of the chapter. Um, this quote out of the, the um, commentary written by Great House. It says, Romans 7 highlights the hopeless dilemma humanity faces under law, whether the Mosaic law or enlightened conscience. We know what we ought to do and even want to do, but we are driven to despair by the realization that we remain incompatible on our own of achieving the good ends we seek. And so um, kind of to just, to just expand on that just a little bit, um, Great House is basically saying, you know, that we try but we realize that we can't do that all on our own. We have to have, you know, we have to have the help of the Holy Spirit in order to to do these things. Um, it's not through our power to yeah. do these things. I mean, I just think about my own personal experience. There are so many, so, so many, unfortunately, uh, too many um, times in my life where I've even said, uh, I just, I, I can't get this right. I can't, I can't, why can't I stop doing this? Why can't I, why can't I, why can't I get this right, right? And it's, and it does come down to, when, when, when and, I, and it ties in a little, a little bit later in the chapter, but, but it really does tie into the, if, if it's, if, it, if I keep doing it, right, it's, it's not, it's not me that's doing it, and that's not to let me off the hook. It's the fact that there's sin inside of me, like that's, so that's the realization, again, the, the, the harshness that doesn't come across very harsh when I read it this in in the, in the form that we just did. But to understand that what Paul's saying is, if if I continue to sin, if I continue to struggle with what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin living in me. That's not to let me off the hook. That's to understand that there is still sin inside of me. That as we've looked over the last two or three chapters of Romans, we realize that if sin is in me, I'm not living for Jesus. I'm actually a weapon against God, mm -hmm. against righteousness. And so we, it's, it's, it, that's a huge thing. If, if, you, if you find yourself continuing to do what you do not want to do and what you know you should not be doing, man, that's, it's, there's sin in you. And we got, that's what we've got to get rid of. Not, not that you're an awful person, but that there's something inside of you that needs to be changed and taken out and taken out back and shot, as we talked about last week. So um, there in 14, we'll just kind of start it in here. Uh, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So um, it said there in, in the commentary, we know that the law is divinely inspired. So when he says the law is spiritual, so he's saying, you know, we know that the law is divinely inspired. Unaided by the Spirit of God, I am morally in, impotent to fulfill law, the law's demands, so like the law's demands. Yeah. Um, and then I was, um, so we know in Paul's, you know, through his testimony and stuff like that, and, uh, oh, I wish I would have wrote this down because now I'm going to be flipping through my Bible, or at least, uh, but there in Philippians, um, it kind of comes to, 
uh, this verse, and I'm not going to find it. <laughs> One-handed. <laughs> so it's in Philippians uh, chapter 3, um, right around verses 5 and 6 that we, you got it. You want to read those two verses? Yes. Uh, so verse 5 of chapter 3 says, Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as far as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Mm -hmm. So that was what Paul was saying at, as, him, as himself. So like he was saying, and I did find it eventually, um, you know, he, like he, he, um, the, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee, like Paul was describing himself here in this in this Philippians verse, and so, and so as you look at back on that that Romans verse, you know, um, but I am unspiritual, sold to a slave as sin. Like Paul was the Hebrew of Hebrews, and he's still saying here, you know, it, before he came to this, he was unspiritual and sold as a slave to sin. Um, and so there in, you know, we have this, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. Uh, I do not do, but I hate to do. And then it goes on. And if I do what I don't do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And so we kind of in this 12 and 14 and later on in, in 16, um, we or in 12 we saw that paul says that the law is holy uh so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy righteous and good and then we see in verse 14 he calls the law spiritual and in 12 and 16 he calls the law good and so it kind of um in the commentary it kind of brought up this question if the law is holy spiritual and good it must be just but if it's impossible to fulfill how can it be just and as i thought about that that question that I kind of posed in the the commentary i thought of the verse in matthew where jesus says and i have it written here i should have written the other one down do not think i have come to abolish the law of the prophets i have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them like, Jesus came so that the loss could be fulfilled. Right. Therefore, it was just because, because of Jesus. Yeah, I mean, if we try to fulfill the law on our own, mm -hmm. we learn through experience that we can't um, because we have a sin nature inside of us. And so that sin nature uh, gives us a bent towards an inability to follow the law completely, right? We can do our best. We can try. It's not going to happen. But as Jesus come, as you rightly fully point out, to fulfill the law, that means that now the law is able to be kept if we are following Jesus in that fulfillment. And we're, we're using the power of the Spirit that has come back to us after Jesus ascended into heaven to be able to fulfill that law, to, to, to follow that law. So, yeah, without, without Jesus, the law is good, but it is not able to be followed completely mm -hmm. because of the sin nature inside of us. Once Jesus comes in, once the Holy Spirit comes in and does a work in us, that's when we can actually follow the law. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like even Paul, you know, the Hebrew of Hebrews, you know, and he's he's been following the law all his life. And even he says, um, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And his realization of back, you know, before he had that Damascus Road experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so we realize through kind of this, what we've kind of read through, that the law isn't the problem, that really sin is the problem. Mm -hmm. And so um, kind of skipping down there just a little bit um, to verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. Um, in some translations, that sinful nature, it says flesh. So that sinful nature or flesh, that word, whatever's used there, according to Wesley, is really me meaning 
the whole man as he is by nature, who I am unaided by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So this sinful nature or flesh, as Paul in some translations it's, um, it's said, is really like the whole man as he is without the Holy Spirit. Um, and then uh, I have another quote there. Well, I, just, I do want to start like, so like that, what's, what that's saying there too, and that's, it's, it's a pretty damning statement. So what, what you're saying there in verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. It does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature. So in my flesh, in, the, in who I am as a person, this is where we get our, our understanding of depravity, right? Like we are, we are not good if we are left unaided, as you say here, by the Holy Spirit. If we don't have Jesus, we're on, we're, we, are, we are evil. And, and my personal experience has shown that, that when I am not following after Jesus, when I am not aided by the Holy Spirit, I have done evil things. Um, and so I think that's, that's a really very true statement and something that we have to be conscious of because so many, so many people, and I'm guessing even those that may be watching today, have spent time in their lives, maybe even now, saying, I'm a good person. We're not. <laughs> like, and I don't want to be, I don't want that to be mean or, or anything other than to recognize, and this is straight from the Word of God, we are not good without Jesus. We are not. Um, and so, that, you know, we, we deal with a lot of different people that think they're good, that, uh, that think that, that they're going to end up in heaven someday. And if they don't have Jesus, they are, they are not good. There's nothing good. It says, I mean, just again to say, I know that good itself does not dwell in me. Uh, that's, that's just a reality. Without Jesus, there is nothing good in us, guys. There's nothing worthwhile. There's nothing of value. Uh, we need Jesus. And again, we love people without Jesus. We uh, have we have family members without Jesus, um, and I love that. I love mine that are like that. Uh, but when they leave this world, their life will have been for nothing, and they're going to spend eternity apart from Jesus. And so that's that's a, that's a big deal to understand. And so that's I just want to make sure we point that out. And so um, I there I have a, after that. A a quote from Great House um, out of the commentary. It says, Paul is not talking about the conflict between two natures in the human self. The human problem is that as flesh, we are contested territory in the conflict between two powers vying for sovereignty over us. The contest is actually sin versus spirit, kind of like what we've talked about before. You're on one side or the other. There's not part of you that's on this side and part of you that's on this side. It's all of you on this side or all of you right. on the other side. Total radical following of Jesus. Nothing left, no stone left unturned to say, I got to get this part right someday. It's Jesus, you have, you can have all of me. And that's, that's what we're talking about here. That's what Paul's talking about here, that it's either one or the other. And that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I wanted to point out there, verse is verse 20. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does. Um, I kind of found it interesting uh, that the commentary said that this was, um, that they found writing from a Greek philosopher, late first century to early second um, BC, that are pretty close to this wording. So this might have been something that they kind of, you know, wording that it seems odd to us today, but really something that they've already seen. And so then it kind of, you know, Paul's putting this into the argument and people are maybe going, okay, now I'm beginning to understand that. Um, but really, as it was in that writing, it was kind of a, a sentence. Uh, it's a type of developing an argument um, that way. And, oh, oh, okay, um, RJ has some batteries back again. So um, we're going to read through uh, there on verse 24. Um, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? 
Um, and really, when I read that verse, I was kind of thinking about that verse back in Isaiah, um, when Isaiah's in, you know, when he has that experience with God, and the tr God's train fills the temple, and, and Isaiah goes, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Um, and so I just really, I, I felt like, I felt like that verse, I mean, it would have been, um, what a wretched man I am. And that, that, that moment of reconciliation, like when you realize it, um, and yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, so he's gone through this whole thing, um, I'm doing what I don't want to do. Uh, I'm doing what I hate to do. The things that I really want to do, I can't seem to get myself to do them. And he's recognizing again. And in, in, in some of those verses, it talks about you know I'm wait this there's war wait uh, this war that is waging in me my my spiritual nature versus my sinful nature. And again, this is remember he's describing his experience up to the point of his here now his realization in verse 24 of of how awful he truly is, like and how awful we all truly are, like without Jesus. So there's this this junk going on inside of us, this battle, this fight. And and how many of us uh, continue to have that struggle? I, I, I do myself where there's like things I know that I shouldn't do and I do them anyway or, or I don't allow myself the opportunity to say no to something and I just react or respond or there's something that I, I should be doing and I don't do it. Um, and, and it's like this thing that keeps building up inside of us and, and we, we keep getting angry with ourselves. And we get to this point, like what Paul says, how awful am I? What a wretched man I am. And we've got to understand that that's the point we need to get to. That's a good point to get to uh, so that we can say, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And it goes on, what, you know, thanks be to God. For, save, for Jesus, basically. Thanks be to God that there is, and we're going to get into chapter 8 here, how awesome uh, Paul thinks that Jesus is. And, and it's just going to be so good. And, and the reality is, if we don't realize how bad we are, if we don't realize that there is a war waging itself in us, sin nature versus our spiritual nature, our desire to be what God wants us to be, if we don't recognize that war, we will fall short. We will not make it. We will end up choosing the sin nature. We can't ride the fence. You've got to recognize and then ride with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so kind of at this point where the, the, there at the end of verse 24, um, it's like all of this, what he's written, has kind of built up mm -hmm. to this point. Like we have gotten to this point, this Verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And so I think, I really think that Paul could probably barely hold back at this point. Um, you know, I think as we start to get excited about things that we'll talk, you know, like faster. And I can just imagine him kind of coming to this point where he's kind of ramping up. And then who... Um, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then that very next verse, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Mm -hmm. ah. And there for that verse, I have another good, um, great house quote. It was just a short one, and it, it just resonated with me. Um, but uh, great house said, Christ challenged and defeated sin on its own turf in the human sphere as a true human of flesh and blood. Like that just, Good. it just hit me this afternoon as I was kind of reading through that and <sighs> challenged and defeated sin on its own turf. Yeah. I mean, I, I that. that's, that's the whole point of, of recognizing that, uh, you know, and we've talked about this even in the, in the sermons last couple of weeks, Jesus got off his throne and came down to earth to be a human being, right? And that's the whole point of this. Like, his victory over sin and death is our victory over sin and death because he allowed himself to become a human being. Like, that's, that's what this all comes down to. That's why 
That's why he's the greatest, right? There's no other, no other God, little G God out there that, that can say the same thing. Mm-hmm. So um, we are going to go ahead and get just slightly into Romans 8. Um, so I want us to just kind of finish out and these first four verses of Romans chapter 8. So, RJ, will you read um, verses 1 through 4? All right, great verse here. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So, um, like I kind of said before, we have now kind of gotten to the heart of this letter. Mm -hmm. Um, The arguments Paul has made up to this point are all pointing towards this chapter. Um, And in this chapter, Paul talks about God's sanctifying grace and the future hope of glorification. And Mm -hmm. so it's kind of the two subjects that he's he's going over in this um, chapter. And so... uh, we have that therefore, which, you know, ties it back to what we just talked about. Therefore, there is now, and I want to point out that now, now, mm-hmm. which is marking the contrast between, between the old era of the law, sin and death, and the new era of the spirit, freedom, and life. And so, therefore, there is now no condemnation. And so, once again, kind of from a few chapters back, we're picking up on this courtroom talk. You know, like we we had discussed, uh, um, this was, uh, you know, a while ago, because I remember um, seeing faces as people kind of realized this. Um, You know, we're back into this courtroom talk where the... um, where God was the judge and the injured party, um, but he was also our advocate. Um, the guilty has been acquitted. That's that, that condemnation. There's no condemnation um, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, and then kind of going on there... Um, Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, when we're saying law in in this verse, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, we're not saying, we're not talking about the Torah, um, but more of like a sovereign. So which one is ruling over our lives once again? Um, And kind of going back to that, that slave language that he made in that argument, um, the law of spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Um, No longer, you know, that discussion we had a few weeks uh, ago of being slave or a weapon of sin or slave to, or a weapon of God. So Paul's kind of, bringing this all back around into this, you know, we've kind of hit the courtroom. Um, we're now going into the slave or the, the weapon language. Um, I think, too, like, just like, so that verse, too, right? So Jesus Christ has set you free by the law of the Spirit over the law of sin and death. So, yeah, which one of those are you going to follow? Like, it's not the, yeah, you're right, it's not the law, like the Torah, like, it's talking about the set of rules, but are you going to follow the Spirit, which Jesus allows you to have access to, so that you don't have to follow the law of sin and death, which is just not a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the, the law of the Spirit, the Spirit inside of you that lets you, lets you then follow 
the Torah or the Ten Commandments or, you know, Jesus' greatest commandments, whichever, whichever way you want to look at how you're commanded to live now, it's all about relationship with Jesus, and it's the Spirit that gives you access to that relationship. And so if you're willing to follow that, you're free from sin and death, and that's a beautiful thing, mm-hmm. beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, yep, yep, just like that when, you know, we talk about freedom, I mean, like there really isn't a, a, a freedom from, you know, either one of those things. It's you're on one side or the other. Right. Um, there's no real freedom, but there is freedom in being a weapon for God. Um, there's that 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 freedom that's in that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, then there uh, in verse three. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so I wanted to kind of point out there that that where it says likeness, um, because this is kind of where we've kind of developed some of this uh, this theology, you know, we have on on who Jesus was like the likeness. So we know that Jesus was 100% human, 100% God. And so it wasn't that he was, you know, uh, he was sinful flesh. It was the likeness. So we, it's the, Paul's wording there that kind of gives us that, that realization that God or that Jesus was 100% human and 100% God at the same time. Yeah, I think it's tough to understand, too, because we, we think so. Sometimes we think Jesus was here on earth and went through all this pain and suffering and temptation, but he was God, right? So, like, big whoop, you know, he, he was going to make it through. He, I, I really believe this, that Jesus could have chosen to sin. I believe that Jesus could have chosen not to get on that cross. He, Jesus could have chosen to call on angels to come and save him. Uh, he could have chosen to give in to the temptations of the devil out in the mountain, or out, sorry, out in the desert. Uh, Jesus was absolutely 100% human, could have chosen uh, to give in to temptation, to do all the things that we as humans have done. He could have done that. He chose it. That's the, he, gave, he gives us the example that it's possible to truly not give in. So I, that's, it's important there that, you know, to understand what, what Paul's saying here is very true, the likeness of sinful flesh, like, he was in our flesh and could have chosen the the sinful things of the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. And another thing I kind of wanted to point out um, there, and we can talk about this mm-hmm. just a little bit, um, but the uh, to be a sin offering, and um, it, this has kind of come up a few times in my classes, and um, but I kind of wanted to point out. Um, that in the Old Testament the sin offerings were given, but the an- and the animals were given death, but they weren't given death as a punishment. They didn't punish the animal given as a sin offering. I mean, they were given death, but it wasn't like a punishment. And so I think sometimes we think of you know Jesus dying as this punishment. Um, but it's a sin offering, and sin offering in, in the Old Testament, animals weren't put, put to death as a punishment. Oh, you're throwing something at me I hadn't thought much about. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, it's absolutely true. It's, so a sin offering was a, it same as anything, you know, whatever you want to use as an offering, the law called for blood mm-hmm. to be shed as the offering given. And so the animals... It, yeah, it's definitely not a punishment against them, and it's not a punishment against Jesus. This just fulfills the law mm-hmm. so that we can stand before God as righteous, right? And so that's that the reality of that is it's not, it's not a punishment. Jesus isn't taking our punishment. He is literally being that mediator, the, mm-hmm. the go-between, the offering that we can't offer. Mm-hmm. Right, the offering, like our blood shed, is does not cover our sins. Only 
the perfect blood of the lamb. And that's what you know, you in the Old Testament stuff, it was the the firstborn of the flock, the healthy of the flock, the the best of the best of your flock was to be given as the sacrifice, not the not the lame three-legged donkey, right? It was the best of the best that had to be given. And Jesus is clearly the best of the best. He is he is the only perfect spotless lamb that could possibly cover my sin and your sin. And so that's that's important to understand that it's it's just this is what had to be done to fulfill the law. Right. Right. Sorry, I kind of Oh, that's all right. That's good. I appreciate there. it. No, that's good. <laughs> um, I should have read my notes ahead of time. <laughs> well, I. That's good. Uh, but yeah, it's just um, I just wanted to kind of point that out because I know that sometimes we kind of get these these thoughts in our head or people say things, mm-hmm. and um, and we don't quite come to the realization of maybe what we believe on these things. And so as it kind of pointed that out there, I kind of wanted to bring up you know, what I believed in that and what, you know, what the, the Bible has to say about that. Let me, let me add to that just real quick because I, I agree with you completely. There's a lot of things that people will believe about Jesus' death on the cross. And so one is that he is taking our punishment. We even, I think we, we sing songs that have that word, those wordings in there a little bit. Um, and it's, a, it's kind of a romantic way of thinking about it. Like Jesus is taking what I should, and, and there's some truth to that as well. But the reality is, He's not just re- he's not replacing us on the cross. He is literally taking our sins off of us, putting them on his shoulders and then offering his blood so that we can be covered and cleansed. Right. So and, and there's a lot of Old Testament thing. You know, you talk about the um, the uh, sacrificial uh, lamb. And the, the, the one that then they let run away as well as the, the escaping of the thing. And, and there's just so much symbolism in that. And it's still true for this. So when we think about, if we think of it as Jesus being punished for our sins, then we usually will then think that when we sin, we need to be punished still. Mm-hmm. Or when someone else sins, they need to be punished for their sins. And that's just not the way our loving God works the, the penalty for the sin has already been paid for. The offering has already been given. We just need to accept it and move forward in grace and mercy and love. And so that's, it's beautiful. And I'm going to get too excited here, so I'll let you keep going. Well, kind of one of the things that um, kind of got me thinking about this was one of the, our last uh, uh, classes that I had in person, actually. So you, that tells you how long ago it's been. We kind of discussed this. Um, when people go, I know Jesus forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. Like you are trying to take that, and you you can't you can't be punished for that. Like Jesus, you know, was given as the sacrifice, and we can't take that back away from him. Therefore, there's now no condemnation, right? Including self condemnation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is no condemnation, and that's what Paul, you know, is saying here. Like once, if you are in Christ Jesus, because of what Christ did, there is now no condemnation. No means no. Right. right. None. Zero. Zilch. No condemnation. So, I mean, we get to the point, you know, where we feel this grieving over things that we've done. But there's no way that we can be punished for things that we've done. Because that is taken care of oh my goodness yeah god's not going to punish us again for what he's already allowed jesus blood to cover as a sacrifice right it's just it, that that is not the way a loving god is going to work mm-hmm. you are forgiven right Woo-hoo! Okay. right right i just i want to make sure we kind of understood like this whole passage right through there um you know God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be the sin offering, what the law was powerful, powerless to do. Um, It just, it's such a, like I said, well, like you said too, you know, Romans 8 is just such an awesome, awesome chapter. There's so much in there. Um, Okay, so, sorry, we kind of got off my notes there. Um, So then I have another quote there. Rather than condemning powerless human beings, God condemned sin. He pronounced sin's doom. 
So far as Christians are concerned, sin is dead, stripped of its power, dethroned from its tyrannical rule over us, and destroyed as a controlling influence in our lives. I think you need to read that with a little bit more excitement, Marcy. <laughs> like that's that's good stuff, I know, right? I know. Sin is dead. It is stripped of its power. Like we 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 are the ones that let it have power over us. We are the ones who allow sin to continue to trap us. But if we are in Christ and we will allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, sin has no power. None. We can live free from sin. I can't, I can't say that more strongly and encourage you to try to live in that. We're not going to be perfect in it, but we can absolutely live free from the power of sin. It has none. So, yeah, I know. I read that, just dethroned from its tyrannical rule over us and destroyed as a controlling influence in our lives. Like, that's just, I'm so, so ever grateful for that, that it doesn't have to have power over me. That was taken care of long ago. Um, So, moving on just a little bit, in verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And I wanted to point out there, um, it says the righteous requirement of the law. Um, so n- he's not, he didn't say requirements. Um, Paul is saying once again, or Paul is once again saying that the law is fulfilled through Christ, The law in its entirety is fulfilled. Not just some of the requirements, but the requirement, the whole Mm -hmm. thing. Um, Once again, Paul is bringing that point around. And in, uh, I know in the NIV, it says fully met in us. Um, But some versions will read fulfilled. Um, fulfilled in us and so he it's meaning that he Jesus enables us to walk according to the spirit it's not anything that we can do um, but something that Jesus has done which has enabled us Mm -hmm. to walk yeah it's Jesus inside of us Mm -hmm. that actually fulfills the law Mm -hmm. that's the that's beautiful like G, it, and it, so it's, again, that points back to that relationship of us with God, us with Jesus. Jesus inside of us fulfills the law. We are righteous before God, even though we're lawbreakers, even though we're sinners. We have been forgiven. We are free from condemnation. And Jesus living inside of us is what sets us free from the law of sin and death. And it's what fulfills completely that law and makes the law followable, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and fulfilled. That's it, it's Jesus inside of us. And so if Jesus isn't in you, we recognize that by the law not being fulfilled and followed. But when Jesus is truly in us, again, and, and when, we, when we have those moments where, where we don't allow Jesus or the Holy Spirit to work in us, and we react in a moment or we make a, a sinful choice because we still have the capabilities of doing this. Like, this doesn't take away our free will. Mm-hmm. Please hear me on that. This does not take away our free will. But Jesus inside of us allows us the opportunity to always say yes, always make the choice that God wants us to make if we will rely on the Spirit of Jesus living in us. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good. So that's uh, basically all I had. Um, I just w- kind of wanted to, I didn't want to leave us kind of in that, that, that end of verse 7 because there's, it just, that, the way Paul brings that right around through those first four verses of chapter 8, just, 
I know it's not really a, there's not really a break there in our in our Bibles, but I just wanted to bring us kind of around to that so that we can think through this entire argument, you know, from the beginning, um, you know, from him talking about us being on one side or the other as a slave or as a weapon, as you know, in a courtroom, in all these different ways that he's brought us to us, brought this argument to us, and now this argument is finally kind of coming around and he's saying because of this because of jesus yeah and i, and I want to challenge you guys to, to to go over that chapter 8 verse 1 if you feel condemnation whether it's from yourself whether it's from some outside source whether you think it's from god i promise you it's not but if you think it is or you feel like it is i want you to write that down this week even maybe you might even feel comfortable enough to, to let us know what it is on in the comment section. But but make yourself aware and then hold yourself accountable to this idea that there is now no condemnation. Because of what God did through Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So two things. If you feel condemnation, one, you might not be in Christ Jesus. And that's okay to understand and recognize. Let's get that right. Let's get, let's get a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then number two, the other possibility is that you're letting the devil lie to you, right? He's, you're letting the devil lie to you about your own self-condemnation or somebody else condemning you or you think that the Bible condemns you. There is no condemnation. So write it down and pray about it. Talk to Marcy or myself, and we would love to walk you through that so that you can understand what it is to feel no condemnation for the things that have happened in your life if you are in Christ Jesus now. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Don't let, I mean, may, rely on this promise. This is a promise in the Bible. Underline it, circle it, mark it up. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yep. That's all I got. That's, yeah, no, I can't go any more than that. That was, it's great. I, it is, it's one of those promises that just, um, we really need to, really need to, kind of chew on for a while you know there's no condemnation all these things that you know I think is um, that I'm going to get punished for or something and we still need that reminder that there's no condemnation now that we've come into a relationship with Christ and allow him to you know to th live in us there's no condemnation Amen. Why don't you close this out in prayer? Okay. Lord, we just we just thank you. We just thank you for this promise that there's no condemnation um, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you just continue to remind us of that. Um, Lord, you are so, so good. And we just love you so much. And we just thank you for all that you've done. Lord, I just, I thank you for us being able to read through this, um, for you helping us understand what Paul is saying here. And Lord, I just thank you for that. I just thank you that we are able to read your word and to learn more about you and that you reveal yourself to us. And Lord, I just thank you for that. Lord, we just pray that you continue to be with us through the rest of this week um, and just continue to help us process this information. And Lord, we just pray that um, you be with the people of our churches this week. Um, continue to help us realize this. And if there is any anybody that needs help from, with this, Lord, I just pray that you just prompt them to reach out to, to one of us so that we can help through this, help talk through this. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for community um, and that we're able to do that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.